Okay, so welcome to Rebels with a Cause, which is an interview series where I'm going to bring you leaders who are making a big impact in this world. And today I get to interview the one and only Louise Green. So Louise, you have a big bio of all kinds of cool stuff you've been doing. So I'm going to read what you sent me. And you are a fitness activist, a global coach, and author of Big Fit Girl my copy here and for the last decade louise has disrupted the fitness industry by leading counterculture movement for women to unleash their inner athlete at every size through her movement she has honored as one of the top trainers to follow by self magazine and five canadian women boldly changing the world by women of influence in 2017 her book big fit girl changed the fitness landscape at bookstores around the world Louise transforms women to define themselves through endorphins, not weigh-ins. She amplifies her message through her coaching programs, her column at Self Magazine, and through the media. Louise has appeared on The Steve Harvey Show, BBC, and the UK and Australian Morning Show. And now you're appearing here. Yay! Yay. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to interview you is because when I read your book, I was just overwhelmed by how aligned our messages and our mission is. And a big motivation for me and the Diet Rebellion is the next generation coming up and to make sure mm -hmm. that they grow up with different messages than what we've grown up with. So they can use their minds to do really cool stuff instead yeah. of worrying about their bodies. Yeah. Uh, so that really spoke to me in your book. And the other piece that I loved was you have really redefined exercise and fitness as athleticism because it's not the same thing, right? I mean, a fitness model doesn't actually have to be athletic, mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> uh, which is very cool. So I love that piece. And I just love what you're doing and how you're getting that message out there. And when I did your six week program, I cannot tell you what a difference it made to see you on the screen doing the work instead of you know the token fat girl in the back corner who's doing the modified version that makes you feel a little less than and yeah. it was so empowering and I finished the workouts and I felt so good about myself <laughs> and yeah. I just so thank you so much absolutely it's my life's passion so I'm glad that it impacted you that way because yeah. you know not everyone is motivated by by a larger woman doing exercise but I feel like it's a breath of fresh air for many people. Well, it is because I mean, when I look at you and when I look at me and I look at the average size woman in North America, we're it. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> we are not actually the fat girls in no. your average everyday life. And yet in the fitness world and in the fashion world and mm -hmm. in the diet world, <laughs> yeah. our bodies are perceived as something uh, grotesque and, and mm -hmm. terrible. So I would really love to hear how you got into this. Um, I got into fitness because I started running to lose weight. It was one of those things where I looked at these magazines of runners and I thought, well, look at those bodies. Like, that's exactly what I want. That I had been chasing that for more than a decade, all through my 20s. And so I thought, well, if I run, because everything else I'm trying is not really working, but if I do that, then maybe I could achieve that. And so I joined a local 5K clinic here in Vancouver. And on the first night, I walked in and a woman introduced herself as our run leader. And I looked at her and I was like, she's plus size. What, what's going on here? Like, I've never seen this. You know, this was before Instagram and the, the Facebook, you know, inspirational social media people. So I literally had never seen a woman who looked like me in fitness leadership or as a runner. I live in Vancouver. It's the healthiest city in Canada. It's highly active, major running community and not big runners. So it's very typical running body. So I already felt like a complete fish out of water. And then this woman was there who I ended up training with for 12 weeks. And what really struck me about her is that she was not there to lose weight. She was not doing this to lose weight. It was for the athletic achievement. It was for, you know, the accomplishment and all the things that, that athleticism can bring to you. And so I really started to kind of like take a, take a look at her like, this is bizarre. Like I've never seen this. Yeah. Literally never seen a woman who was larger not trying to lose weight. 
And she profoundly impacted me to continue training for longer distance races. And eventually, um, I hired a personal trainer who was kind of of the same ethos of, um, you know, do your whatever your athletic dreams are in the body you have right now. This is not about expending calories. This is about feeling fantastic. And that trainer asked me if she would if I could assist her in a 10k running clinic as a volunteer leader so now I've gone full circle gone through the program I'm the leader wow. and I did that for five years in a volunteer position while doing my day job and eventually um I worked in in uh at a talent agent where I um worked in the commercial industry where I was providing actors for commercials and so they were very yin and yang. One was on the weekend feeling so empowered and, you know, just alive with all these people telling them they can do it at any size. And then on the Monday morning, going into my job at the agency and telling these beautiful people the feedback from the producers that they needed to whiten their teeth or lose 10 pounds. And it just felt like so contradictory that I could no longer do that work. I had to leave. And I eventually left and saw a major hole in the fitness industry that I thought I could fill and, and opened a business specifically for plus size women. So amazing. And I mean, that a couple of things strike me in that. One is the assumption is women are exercising to lose weight. So far as I know small women, thin women who don't exercise is they don't know that there are health benefits to exercising because yeah. they're not trying to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just that whole idea of being there for the functional fitness size of it. And I, when I was in high school, one of my very lean friends, very tall, went to a modeling agency and she was told to lose 10 pounds. And I remember the feeling I had was, wow, I mean, if she's still too fat, whoo. <laughs> yeah, what does <laughs> that, that make that me, right? like... me? Oh yeah, it was, it hurt. Yeah, it was tough. And that's what's really disturbing, you know, even today, while you're saying that we want to create a new message for the next generation, is that even the most pristine, beautiful people, according to the idealistic standard, are not good enough. No. And that's what we're being, that's what's being presented. So, yeah. of course... Yeah. The 55-year-old woman who is a size 20 at home is thinking, God, I completely yeah. have lost the mark, right? When yeah. really she's, she's the typical average woman. Like you were saying, like the majority of women. So I heard somebody say once that women over a size 14 are an invisible majority. Yes. Yeah. And it's such an accurate description because we are not represented in anywhere. I remember when I was, I was again, probably in high school and oh, if I could remember the name of the magazine, but they put a, a girl on the cover and she was maybe about a size eight. And I remember standing at the mall with all of my girlfriends and them talking about how could they put a fat girl on the fitness magazine. And again, I was maybe a size six at the time. And I just, I, again, I could not get over the idea that I, to fit in, to, to be okay, to be accepted, I had to look a different way. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite lines of my own self is I couldn't have dieted myself to a thigh gap any easier than I could have dieted myself to six feet tall. Like I'm just not mm -hmm. built that mm -hmm. way, but I, I never saw myself never. And, and it just breaks my heart because I wasn't even one of the bigger girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah blows my mind. So while you were making this transition, what was the biggest struggle for you? Um, I think that it was, I still had so many years of wanting to change my body, conform it to what I thought it should be. And that, you know, even during that time where I felt like I was getting it, like a new, a new way of living, it took so long. And even today, like, you know, even today, somebody will say, oh, there's this new thing and I'll really have to look at it yeah. to, to kind of suss it out. But, but I know like, I, and then I do the full circle talk right. in my head and I'm like, no, next. Right. But, but you know, even today we're so deeply programmed and conditioned. And I think I really struggled that for, for years, even while I was coaching women and even while I was, you know, telling people there was a different way, there was still 
of, you know, something that kept pulling me back and, yeah. and that I needed to like galvanize over and over again, that that's not the way. And what impact did that have on you? So struggling with that, even today, you're an author, you're an activist, you're getting more and more publicity. How does that impact you? Um, the struggle? Yeah. Having that uh, sort of dichotomy almost in minds where the, what most of you knows, but there's just that little piece. Yeah. Um, I think for me, what's great about it is that it's a good reminder all the time and that it's just a very small whisper now, whereas before it was dominating my every thought, like it was yelling all the time, <laughs> you need to change. Like it was, it was infiltrating every thought in my mind that you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You've got to change. And like you say, like, you know, I can't diet into a thigh gap. I read a statistics the other day. Um, that I think it's about 63% your body is um, derived from genetics. Yes. So the, the, the remaining part is, you know, lifestyle, but that's a, that's a major majority of, of that's fighting against you if you are not of a certain genetic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's, yeah, that, I mean, that's huge and that people don't understand how much of their body type, because that's not the messaging, right? It's the, like the butt boot camp where you can have the perfect butt in 10 weeks mm -hmm. and, you know, the, oh, the flat stomach and the, cause you know, you can, I, I might have a six pack under here. I don't know. I don't know. What it looks like under there because there's a layer there. I know for a fact I have a six pack under well, there, but it's I like, know it's pretty strong. <laughs> You know what? Most people have a six pack under there. Right? Um, but just because it can't be seen from the outside does not mean that it's not there and it's not functional. It's not awesome. Um, and I think the other point with what you said that was so important for, for the listeners is that that voice doesn't actually go away. And I've experienced that too. I mean, I have been doing mm -hmm. this work for a very long time and you know, it still pops up. You know, I still see it. I still consider it. I still sometimes pass the mirror and do a bit of a, mm. oh, you know, I mean, it's not that it goes away. It's like you said, though, it doesn't dominate. It's a whisper. Mm -hmm. And it's a good reminder for that conversation to come back. And that's where I see my biases. And that's where I see all kinds of cool stuff when that voice shows up now. So it's a very mm -hmm. different experience. Yeah. So um, I think you, the inspiration for your change was it just, was it that runner that you met or was there something bigger or different? Um, I was, during the time that I joined that run clinic, I was in quite a time of self improvement, like where I just, I was doing a lot of self work. And so, you know, I started to, to do all the aspects of like the meditation and, and uh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, and just really like look at myself so oh my god i'm so sorry i'm gonna quickly go down the hall um you're like putting your dogs away i'm like i hope he stays quiet um so I, I have two of them it would be a full-on war if they heard your dog bark so it's all good this is, um, this is real life here <laughs> i'll go into my office um so you know i was in this place of real self-discovery just one second yep I'm so sorry, Carrie. Um, <laughs> it's all good. I love it. <laughs> I do. Welcome I love to it. my world. Well, it's just, to, we were just talking about how everything's staged to look all pretty, yeah. like we've got all of our shit yeah. together and we don't. <laughs> sorry, guys. Perfect. Um, so no, I, I think it was just that it kind of, you know, when things line up where I, this, I was talking to my own coaching group yesterday about this is that it is not by accident that this woman entered my life. It is not by accident that she entered my life at the exact time that I was in a period of change. Yeah. And it is, I think that these people enter our lives at all different kinds of times, but we have to be in a position to see them and hear them. Isn't it Yoda that says that when the student is ready, the teacher appears? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. It was, it was, you know, just the timing and where I was, you know, I'd, I'd been through the, you know, this is, my story is not unique. It's like, I'd been through the diet cycle, like thousands of times and thousands of dollars and thousands of failures and just, 
internalizing it over and over again to me being a failure and why can't I get my stuff together and what's wrong with you? And I mean, that kind of just the whole thing that we've all done. Um, and, and there she appeared and just had such a profound Im impact on me, like life changing. That's awesome. So in that transformation, what were some of the, the biggest challenges, whether they be external or internal? I mean, you already talked a little bit about the job and just that about face at Monday morning and go, oh, mm -hmm. um, what other things came up through that? Because I know my journey has not been, it's not all, it's not all pretty and easy, right? It's not a, I'm going to change my mind and change how I perceive my body and then just magically no. shoot off into bliss. What were some of the big things that hit you that you really had to get through or past or around? Um, well, it's funny. I had, I had a call yesterday with my group where I told my story. So it's very fresh in my mind that, um, you know, one of the biggest struggles for me was not owning it. Like I, when I became a fitness professional, still had such a great deal of shame around why would I think that I could be a fitness professional? Why would anyone take me seriously? Yeah. Please don't ask me what I do for a living. I don't want to have to deal with your blank stare or looking me up and down like they don't know what to do with that information. Yeah. Like I, just, I played small because I was still full of shame. Mm. So I was like, you know, wanting to, to work with women and help them engage in, in changing their relationship with exercise. But I didn't want anyone to know that I was doing that. So I really struggled with identity because I felt so much shame around it. And it's funny, the pivotal point for me was I, uh, as soon as I opened my business, um, it, it was called Body Exchange and it was exclusive to plus size women. That didn't mean that if you weren't plus size, you couldn't come. But it was dedicated to this group of women who I personally felt had been sidelined on many levels in health and wellness. And because of the wording around that, it garnished a lot of media attention. And it wasn't, it wasn't in the beginning positive media attention. It was very negative and it was very, you know, you're discriminatory, you're, you're alienating people. And I just was like so taken back by that. I was like, we, we're doing the exact opposite to a group who has been discriminated against and who has been sidelined. Yes. So um, this one article came out that said, Jim bans skinny people. Oh, wow. and it was on the front page of the news, of the national newspaper. And um, I received calls from all over the world. Literally, I was getting calls from Ireland to do interviews. It was ridiculous. My phone would start vibrating off my desk at 5 a.m. And it was that point that I was like, no more. I am not being fat girl under the radar anymore. I am taking a stand for this. This is crap. And that's the p pivotal point. Like what was such a negative experience, I would be bawling that these people were hounding me. But really, it was the most pivotal point of my career because it was like, it, it just pushed me over the edge. We're like, no, I'm going to tell you what I do for a living. And I'm going to tell you why I do it for a living. And I'm going to tell you exactly why this is so important. Because what's happening in our fitness and wellness industry is it's greatly affecting the health of women everywhere because they're too intimidated and they're too fearful and their fear of judgment and failure is real because people don't know what to do with them and there there's so much weight bias out there that they're not treated appropriately mm -hmm. I remember the last time I went to join a gym uh, my son was doing swim lessons and he was at that stage where he didn't need me in the pool with him yeah. and I thought you know I haven't been in a gym or done fitness thing in quite some time, I'll just join the gym and then I can do it while he's there. Perfect. So I set up a time with one of the trainers and she's going to show me how to do everything or so I think. And she starts asking all these questions and then she came down to, well, what do you weigh? And I said, I don't know. I hadn't weighed myself in years. It was an abusive relationship. Me and the scale, it was bad. Mm -hmm. So I put it away. And, um, and she said, well, well, there's a scale right there. And I said, no, 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 I choose not to know how much I weigh. It's important for my mental health and my overall well-being. I just don't 
you know, and she just, she was, I don't know, probably in her sixties and she was just befuddled. She didn't know, <laughs> but I need that number. I said, well, put in 200 pounds. She said, you don't weigh 200 pounds. I'm like, you don't know what I weigh. <laughs> Just, I don't know, pick a number, put 300, put a hundred. I don't care. What do you need it for? Well, I need it for the machines to work properly. Well, long story short, it came around to, it was so that they could count my calories burned properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I just about lost it on her. <laughs> I, yeah. You asked me what my goals were when I came in. I was so clear <laughs> yeah. about me getting my strength back and my fitness back, not about weight loss. And yet she just... It, she could not wrap her head around that idea at all. It was, it was heartbreaking. So guess what I didn't do? I didn't work out, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. because it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely so uncomfortable and, and just, yeah. So it, I'm so grateful that you have done that you decided to step up because the world needs more people to do that. And I think you're giving permission for people to do that. Mm -hmm. You're giving women permission to put on the shorts and the t-shirt or the tank and actually spend some money on athletic clothing so they don't mm -hmm. chafe and stink and be uncomfortable and actually mm -hmm. get out there and do what is fun. <laughs> well, you might stink, but that's okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> different kind of stink. <laughs> well, you know what? Stink. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because I've been trying to think of ways in which I can work with the education system around the people that certify trainers. Yes. Because the reason, like, I, I really do get angry when I hear stories like that. But at the end of the day, I think to myself, they are only projecting what they've been taught, right? Absolutely. Because I know what they've been taught because I was taught it too, right? Like, yep. you've got to have a smart goal. It's got to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. But, you know, if I put that in front of the majority of the women I work with, they, they get overwhelmed and it's pressure and it's this and it's that. And really, it's just like we just want people to build a healthy relationship with movement yes. because it will improve the longevity of your life for most people. Yeah. So the way that fitness professionals are being certified is so black and white and there is no question in the education that if somebody comes in and they are of a certain size and completely measured by the BMI metric, BMI metric system, oh, yes. which is complete crap, yep. um, that is what trainers are told to work off of. Um, then, then they, there's no, there's no discussion around firstly, find out what the client's goal is. It yeah. may not be weight loss. Yep. That, that's not even said anywhere. And for, so, so they are conditioned and educated and trained to look at somebody that's outside of their BMI and reduce them. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, my, my day job is being a naturopathic doctor and it's, it's the same, it's the same thing, you know, the, the mm -hmm. fear around fat. Um, and I mean, naturopaths, nutritionists, medical doctors, nurse practitioners, actually, I think you were telling a story in your book about that when you walked into someone's office and sat mm -hmm. down and he didn't even look at you and he just no. calculated your BMI and said, weight loss. That's what you need. Yeah. Yeah. You're a health risk is what he said. Yeah. Like yeah. he didn't even look at me and he's like, did you know that you're a health risk? And I'm like, you don't even, yeah. you haven't asked me one lifestyle question, not one, like mm -hmm. you haven't asked me any family history. You haven't asked me nothing. Yes. Very important. Calculation. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so that's, and, and, and honestly, like that's why so many women who they fear that they, they don't want to go and be told that they're a health risk and, and look down upon. And, and, and the other thing too, is that many people are given that information with no plan around it. Oh Your yeah. So oh, good to know. Bye. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> I said to a client not long ago, I said, you know, being told by anybody to just what you need to do is go and lose weight is mm -hmm. about as effective as saying you need to go touch the surface of the moon. Because yeah. there's currently not one, not one scientifically validated way to get someone from fat to not fat and keep them there. Yeah. Like it's just really it's not there so yeah. how's about we change up the plan yeah um, totally. it's, <laughs> it's clearly not working but it's it's mind-boggling to me 
as a scientist and as a doctor and the way that we're trained that we're supposed to be evaluating the evidence and we're supposed to be having our patients health at the top of our list and yet this is influencing women of all sizes i mean they don't not have to be overweight and obese they can be no. and, and it's still happening well you should really weigh this number yeah where the heck did you get that from like yeah Ah, anyways, no, I, just, I can remember I can like remember. going to Weight Watchers for like 80 billion times and them saying to me, like the amount of weight that they wanted me to lose to get into this BMI. I was like, I haven't weighed that since I was like 12. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it's physically possible, but I was, but because they were saying it and I trusted them as the people that were like the health people. Absolutely. I, I thought that that that's what needed to happen. And further to what you were saying about um, keeping people's health at the top of the agenda is when did we not include mental health as part of the equation, right? So yeah. when you have somebody that's stuck in that cycle of failing and failing, what does that do to somebody's mental health, right? What does it do to someone's mental health when they're told that they're a health risk with no like no plan or support? Yeah. They're just like on your way do yeah. something about it. And so people go home and they think, you know, I'm a loser. Absolutely. And, 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 and then they just stay there. And yeah. so we've totally disregarded mental health in this yeah. equation. I think we've, we've disregarded as a culture, every measure of health, except for weight. I mean, there's relationships, there's socioeconomic, that is a, a has a huge impact on someone's health, longevity, morbidity. I mean, there are so many layers to what actually defines health. It is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And yet we've tried to reduce it to, you know, calories in, calories out, just lose weight, bada bing, bada boom. And, and now we have this entire society that is completely dysfunctional around food and fitness in their bodies. And how are they supposed to raise their children to have a healthy relationship with food? You know, and they're terrified of sugar and they're, you know, they're, I've met children who have not ever had birthday cake and they're six years old and they go to a birthday party and the parents are freaking out because, oh my God, they let them have cake. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. are they allergic to something in the cake? Will they die? Oh, yeah. then, you know, it's just gotten so out of control. Um, I actually just recently was talking to a new, a new client and she had these people who flew in from in Ontario. They flew in from Quebec and spent the weekend with her preparing meals and teaching her how to cook and filling her freezer full of food. And they gave her this fitness program. And here's the kicker. They said, but don't worry about it. If you don't have time, the most important thing is the food. Fitness doesn't really um, add to the weight loss. And I just about lost my head. <laughs> like, they're health coaches? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And yet... Fitness wasn't the first thing. What? It just blew my mind. So needless to say, she has your book now. And <laughs> working towards finding something else. Um, so what's, what are the three, what, what are three things that people can implement right now? What are three things that our audience right now could start to do? Let's assume, actually, before we go there, I forgot the one thing that I was most keen on hearing your thoughts about. <laughs> when I was in one of your coaching calls, we talked about exercise trauma. Mm -hmm. And you were the first person that had ever said it. And it stuck in my head because it had me thinking, I mean, I was very athletic growing up, uh, but I had a lot of social anxiety that was undiagnosed and unrecognized. And so being on the track team, being on the ice, being on, it was, it was very anxiety provoking for me. And so in a way, and it had a bit of exercise trauma, but you, you've experienced this yourself and you've seen a lot of it. So tell us about exercise trauma and, and what it does to, to people. Well, I didn't really know it was a thing until I would have these conversations over the years with women. And I'd start to like, kind of probe a little bit to find out when the fitness for them dropped off in their lives. And so um, I, I started to see a pattern of 
people that had had a negative experiences. And for some of them, it was during gym classes in elementary school where they were forced to put on a gym strip. So they were forced to wear shorts. They were forced to, um, you know, do the, the mile run in the morning where they came in last and, and uh, just very negative experiences. A lot of them coming from high school gym class. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other experiences where people were, you know, in more in their adult lives where they would go to a boot camp or whatever and, you know, get left in the dust or, or you know, couldn't do it and nobody was there to help them modify anything. And again, just internalizing that failure and feeling like a loser, like what's my, it's, it's me. And that I started to recognize that this wasn't just a bad experience, that this was actually trauma for them. And that their brain related those experiences to negativity and pain. And so um, really it was about trying to reframe fitness for them because they were just so traumatized by the situation. The other place I see trauma is when people are in disordered situations where they um, either have eating, dis- well, it's mostly eating disorders where they're using exercise excessively. And so they're very um, trigger uh, sensitive to going back to that wave. So they have a trauma around like it being very punishing. Right. So it was, a, it was, you know, about like, you know, getting like really grinding their bodies down to get, uh, you know, the results that they wanted. So there was a few different ways in which I saw it, but I saw it often and I'd hear these stories and that it wasn't just about that it needed to be taken more seriously than, oh, you just had a bad experience. Right. You know, like this was something that was real for them and like so real that it had been 20 years since they had moved their body kind of thing. Like it, it, it had been significant amount of time since they approached movement again because of these situations. And so I just invite them to kind of reframe and invite a new experience. And so when people are doing that, they have to be very careful about what they go back to, because if it happens again, hmm. they're pretty much lost. Right. right. Um, so, you know, in the book I talk about, you know, chapter three is dedicated to, finding the right people because I think if you can find the right people it can be really life-changing um I couldn't agree more yeah yeah so and finding the wrong people can be really traumatizing Mm -hmm. well since since we had that conversation I think that was I don't remember when I did your program October or September anyways back in the fall at some point um I've been having more conversations with my patients and my clients around this because it's one of the, like I, I work mostly in the mindset and relationship with food side of things. And I, fitness is such an important piece and I, you know, we talk about it, but there was always this stumbling block. They just couldn't, the, the desire to do it was there, but the actual action, just they couldn't make it happen. So I started asking better questions mm-hmm. after our conversation and was shocked by how many of them it came right into childhood, that mm-hmm. exercise was the punishment for eating the cake, or it was mm-hmm. associated with the diet, or it was, you know, the doctor said, you're getting fat, we're now going to go bike riding or go running or go mm-hmm. and just that from such a young age, mm-hmm. fitness as, like you said, a punishment and a negative experience. I also see it in situations where parents are overbearing in sports where, you know, the child doesn't necessarily want to be doing it at the level that the parent does. Right. And, you know, they're, they're, the parent is so hard on that child. And I see it sometimes even in my, you know, with my son's games and stuff. I'm like, just back off. Like you're yeah. making this a negative experience for that kid. Yeah. And I know what the repercussions of that for the long term of their life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, get your own agenda out of here. <laughs> Put that down. <laughs> Let them find something they love. Yeah. 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 So, back to before I almost lost my train of thought. Yes. What are the three, three, three tips you'd like to give the audience today of how they can reconnect with fitness? And with well, I think... With this whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, one of the great things to do is really to give 
fitness another chance if, if it has been a long break for it for you and to really uh, do the diligent work beforehand so not just oh well there's a gym down the street I'm gonna join it um, but really look very deeply into what you're signing up for because like I said it can be a make or break for for a long time and there's some really key things I talk about in my book that I that I encourage people to look for and the other thing I encourage people to do is to interview people now I talk about this in my book as well but there seems to be some kind of hierarchy between client and trainer that we assume that that person knows more, is way healthier, is smarter, like all these things, right? Yep. And uh, they're the perfect picture of health. I remember finding out that my trainer ate a cookie once and I was like, you did? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that I want people, when they, when they think about fitness professionals, I want them to think of them as somebody you're hiring to clean your gutters, right? Like, it's the same thing. It's a hire for service. Right. And when somebody, you call somebody to hire the, for the gutters, there's no like hierarchy. That guy is so much better than me. He cleans gutters. It's, it's a level playing field. You want to know, like, do you have any references? You know, how are you going to go about this? What's your schedule? Like same thing for fitness professionals. Like what's, what's your, um, you know, style of training? Um, do you offer modifications? Um, what's your position on health at every size? Like you can ask these questions. If they're like, what the hell is health at every size? Then you know that that's probably Find not the new one. <laughs> um, you know, if they answer with things like, I like to grill people, you know, I like to like work people so they get the biggest calorie burn, you know, that kind of thing. Those are things that are good to know before you're in a session with them. And you have every single right to ask. Love it. Yeah. Awesome. And the other thing I encourage people to do is when a business says it's all inclusive or it's body positive or whatever the buzzword of today is, yes. ask them, how is, what is your approach to being all inclusive or what is the, your approach to being body positive? So that they, like if somebody were to ask me that, I could tell you 10 different ways in which we implement that into our business. And you can't just grab a buzzword and throw it up on your website without any tangible evidence behind it. So put them to the test. What is it? And, you know, it doesn't have to be confrontational. It's like you're hiring a gutter guy. Yeah. So that's one thing. Right. Um, finding things that you enjoy. So, you know, don't, you don't have to necessarily be like, well, I should start running or, you know, everyone seems to be crossfitting or whatever. You need to just go with what you think you might enjoy. And some of those indicators can be, what did you enjoy previously? So, you know, maybe when you were six, did you like going down the back lane on the bike? Was that super fun? Well, maybe it's time to get the bike out. You right. know, like, just look at things that bring you joy because when there's joy behind it, there's longevity behind it. Love it. And, you know, to be really careful about getting caught in the old traps about, the all or nothing, the diet mentality. Um, you know, some people use fitness trackers, but I've been hearing a lot of women in my groups talk about how they can actually be detrimental because it's always about the steps and the burn and the, you know, it can get obsessive. And so just do it without any like attachments to start. And if you want to be measurable down the road and look at some statistics around your performance, fine. But in the beginning, just, just do it freely and funly is funly a word it is now i like it <laughs> perfect <laughs> yeah i am um, i print off little calendar pages and literally just some it started out with there'd be a check mark or a smiley face on a day that i moved because that was the only way i could track mm -hmm. without triggering anything weird and then at the end yeah. of the month i could just look at it and i could compare month over month did i move more or less or whatever mm -hmm. and then it it slowly progressed into being able to track more of like how many sit-ups can i do how many curls can i do how many all of those things but i couldn't do that at first because mm -hmm. it, it became a new tool that i could beat myself with as opposed to anything else absolutely yeah. and i think um when we when we think about fitness we think about like 
like we think about what we're, it's the same thing with the beauty um, idealism. There's fitness idealism as well. And, you know, it's like the ripped woman and the crossfitter and the, the running. And so when we start to think about, I, I'm ready to start moving my body, but then we think about the idealism that's surrounding fitness, it becomes overwhelming. And so putting on your shoes and walking to the end of the block and back is a great way to start. Yeah. Like just starting is hard for people because they're overwhelmed by the idealism that they don't fit. Mm -hmm. Well, it's that all or nothing thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously I work more with the food and body image, and, but that's mm -hmm. one of the big things, right? It's that, is this a hard and fast rule or is it a gentle guideline? And at the yeah. end of the day, your body is the ultimate authority on what works for you. Mm -hmm. And it, anything counts. And, and celebrating every win because really when you haven't moved in 20 years walking to the mailbox and back is a big deal that deserves celebration yeah. uh, but people see that as just less than which is disappointing okay so let's sum this up um i mean you answered all my burning questions i had one from um one of the members in, in my group and i think you just addressed that with the how to not fall into that old trap how can people find you and i'll post all of that in uh in the everywhere to just <laughs> how can they find you um well most of all the work i'm doing and and where i can be contacted is at my website which is louisegreen.ca perfect great yeah. So they can find your coaching programs and your book and your whole nine right there. Everything's there, yeah. Love it. I cannot thank you enough for spending time with me today. Thank you for um, having me. I'm sorry about my dog. Oh, don't even worry about it. I am uh, suddenly getting fast paced here because I'm looking at my batteries going, um, your computer's going to shut down now. Oh, okay. it, good. it goes with the dog barking. This is real life of women who run businesses from home, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I, um, yes, thank you so, so very much. And I hope my pleasure. we can do this again. Someday. Yes, awesome. absolutely. Thank you for having me, Carrie. Thanks.